Hello, everybody. Um, I'm Carolyn Greer. I'm one of the co-founders and the co-producer of the Brooklyn Book Festival. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. Uh, we're going to enjoy an exploratory and cosmic conversation. Um, I would like to say one thing. Our credo at the Brooklyn Book Festival is to support authors and buy books. So I hope after you listen to uh, some uh, of the conversation and get just a little taste, you'll be enticed to support these authors and buy their books. I'm now going to turn the program over uh, to the host today. And this program was brought to us by the New York Times. And we have with us Gal Beckerman, who is the senior staff editor for the New York Times uh, Book Review. And I believe that Gall uh, has a focus on nonfiction. And without further ado, I'm gonna turn this program over to Gall. Thank you all. Thank you, Carolyn. And, and I'm thrilled to be here and thrilled to be uh, talking about these fascinating subjects, which um, as you mentioned, they sort of fill up my day. I'm the one who at the Book Review who deals with all the science books. Um, and these are two uh, remarkable ones uh, that we're going to be, the authors of whom we're gonna be talking with today. Uh, let me give you some introductions first, uh, just so we know who everyone is. Um, first, we have with us Dr. Uh, Becky Smith-Hertz, um, who's an astrophysicist at the University of Oxford and star of the astronomy-themed YouTube channel, Dr. Becky, which has over 150,000 subscribers. I want to ask you about YouTube in a, shortly. Uh, she specializes in how galaxies and black holes grow and evolve together, and her most recent book is Space at the Speed of Light. Um, and then we also have with us um, Sarah Seeger, uh, who is also an astrophysicist, professor of physics and planetary science at MIT. She currently chairs the NASA's probe study team for the Starshade Project, which I also want to ask you more about. Um, her research is focused on exoplanets and the search for the first Earth-like twin, and she has introduced many new ideas to the field of exoplanet characterization, including work that led to the first detection of an exoplanet atmosphere. Um, she's from Toronto and her recent memoir is called The Smallest Lights in the Universe. Um, so the first question I want to ask both of you and also feel free to, to jump in at any moment and sort of uh, piggyback on each other's answers or ask each other questions too. I hope this will be pretty sort of informal. Um, is, is, is about sort of our moment right now, sort of thinking about the things that you guys think about all the time right now. There seems to be so many problems here on earth. Um, uh, you know, and I don't need to list them for everyone to know what I'm talking about. And I just, I wonder how you sort of justify to yourselves remaining fixed on what's out there. Um, it, does it offer you perspective or is it a form of escape? Um, or maybe it's both. Uh, Sarah has a, a great, phrase sort of in her book, uh, terracentrism, to explain how we sometimes, you know, is what allows us to sort of not think about the fact that there might be life on other planets elsewhere. But is there sort of an inverse of this concept that can keep astrophysicists from worrying too much about out, what's out there and not thinking about what's here? Or how do you connect, how do you connect the two? Any one of you can, either one of you can jump in. <laughs> Do you want to go first, Becky, or do you want, I can't? <laughs> I said you go first, but I, I don't mind. I mean, it's just, that's like almost an overwhelming question in and of itself. Sure. And we just have so many answers. You know, on the one hand, sometimes we can think, or I can think like, wow, what am I doing with my head in space? We have so many problems here on earth. But, you know, none of us usually get to be a scientist just with like our head in space. You know, a lot of my job is teaching and training the next generation of technology leaders who won't be exoplanet scientists, you know, that there are people at MIT will go out into industry and they will do, do great things. So there's that. And there's also this other thing in science where even in astronomy, you know, you work, work, work on something seemingly perhaps frivolous or just deep or both. And voila, uh, it happens not very often, but when it does, it's big, like a practical application that can help the rest of the world. We actually helped with medical imaging because our astronomical imaging was, you know, directly transferable. And then also it's true, the perspective, I mean, it's not going to help you if you've just lost, lost your job, you know, if your best friend died or a nuclear family member from COVID, none of this perspective may help, but it's true. You know, when we think about our planet will live on, you know, no matter what happens here, coronavirus, climate change, like fires in the West, 
you know, our Earth will survive. It will. It'll last billions of more years, no matter what we do to it. So it definitely gives us a sense of perspective. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with what Sarah said, especially the, you know, this idea that the stuff that we're doing can play into new technology as well. So Sarah gave the example of medical imaging there. And um, what I always like to use is, you know, the, the question of who's driving technology forward. And it's the people right on the front line of research, right? So astronomers, the things that we're driving forward, or at least 20, 30 years ago was, you know, we need to see fainter and further things and, you know, better cameras are invented. In fact, astronomers sort of invented the idea of a digital camera in the first place. And we now all carry one around in, in our pockets just because they didn't want to use photographic plates anymore. And now we have radio telescopes that are taking data quicker than we can even get it off the computer archives. And so it's astronomers that are going to be driving forward data transfer speeds and things like that. So, you know, in the radio astronomy, they have so much data that they have to reconstruct mm -hmm. into an image people can make sense of. Mm -hmm. And, you know, just to store that data is incredible. So yeah, yeah that as well. Yeah. Data storage, data transfer, all of that is going to be driven forward by research science. And so when people ask, you know, why, why do we do astronomy? Why do we fund astronomy? That's, that's sort of my go-to. But then, you know, I always think it's the ultimate of human curiosity astronomy, you know, the sort of like what's over that ocean, what's on the top of that mountain, what's out there. It, it's that big thing. And I know a lot of people get very anxious when they stop to think about the scale of space and the sheer magnitude of it and sort of look up at the sky and see how many stars they can see and you know feel almost so insignificant and small because of it but in my mind i like to look at that as more of hope you know one where you know you have a universe with infinite possibilities and infinite places you could go and people you could be and and that's how i like to look at that and and in that sense that we we can do anything and we can solve any problem that right. we at least put our minds to. And those problems might be ones that we're currently facing on earth as well. So. Right. I'm remembering the recent, the SpaceX launch and the, the kind of on the, the Twitter joke of, can, I, can, we, can we, can everyone come on board? <laughs> everyone sort of wants to, wants to leave. Um, so you, you both work really hard in your writing to make um, space and its phenomena accessible to a wider audience. Um, I know Becky, this is a big part of what, of what you do, but, um, and Sarah as well, but I'm curious sort of why that is important to you. Um, why do you think that it's important? And also sort of, um, from your experience, sort of what do you, what do lay readers or kind of people who don't know, have the level of knowledge that you have sort of, what do they find most interesting? Like what's the easiest way to sort of pull people in? Is it black holes? Is it exoplanets? Like what's the thing that you often find uh, people that you come across who are not from your world um, that is like a, a good sort of entry point to, 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 to this, um, to this, to all this kind of fascinating uh, knowledge that you have? Well, in exoplanets, we maybe have it a bit easier than other fields because <laughs> it's <Alien. science> fiction. <laughs> like, Gal, have you seen Interstellar? Like, did you like Interstellar or, yeah, or Arrival? That was an awesome movie. And it's this like hope and dream that they're, we're not alone. Uh -huh. And there's Star Trek and Star Wars. And so in exoplanets, we're doing the real deal. Right. We're not meeting the aliens because we we're not sure if they're there, but finding the planets is, is the first step. Right, right. And you, and I mean, do you think, you know, I know, you know, your, your memoir was such a, a personal memoir um, and involved writing about your own grief. Was, would you think about when you're writing that also sort of this is bringing people into this world that you care about? You know, is that, is that part of the, not necessarily the motivation, but the kind of an added value to, to somebody who picks up your book and, and reads about your own story? Oh, yeah, an added value is like just an in, in, inside participation in, in the life of one scientist for sure right right um, Becky, um for me yeah I guess I mean how you get into this and why I feel passionate about communicating with the public I think for me was I was very much a why child you know one of those yeah. kids that would constantly ask questions and you know you would ask a question eventually that your parents wouldn't know so you would go ask your teachers and then eventually your teachers wouldn't know and it was sort of where do you go from there and I think by high school I think I eventually realized there are some questions that we nobody knows the answers to and right. that's okay but being that connection between 
curious member of the public who's just always wondered this one thing about something and actually someone who's doing the research you know, on the front lines, if you will, if I could use that expression, I think that's really, really important to to be that connection. Mm. Um, because there are some questions that you can't Google because even Google doesn't know the answer, right? And so those are the things that I think bring people in the most is the the questions they think, you know, has anyone ever thought about this? Or does it, and I mean, for me, that is a lot of the time about black holes because people know that that's my speciality. I love black holes. And I think, you know, exoplanets and aliens are the only ones that can really give black holes a run for their money, Sarah, in terms of dragging people into this world. But also I work um, sort of in black holes in galaxies that are very close to us. So I have the pretty pictures too which I think the exoplanet community doesn't necessarily have, you know, right yet, yet at least. Um, pictures. We have big pictures, but right. <laughs> yeah. Whereas I have these huge, you know, pictures of these huge galaxies that are just so spectacular, these spiral things. And I always like to say that astronomy is a, a gateway science. The right. pictures really, they really draw people into the science. And I think what I love about it is that, as Sarah said before, you inspire the next generation with what you do, you know, either teaching uh, it's sort of a college level or whether you're communicating with the public, you know, you, you yes, you be, could, could be communicating with kids, but you could equally be communicating with their parents who would then value mm -hmm. science as something that they could go into. Um, and you see this effect so often. I think one of the, um, the big things that I remember seeing is, you know, in the US after the Apollo missions, there was this huge spike in uptake in science and engineering PhDs in right. the US that obviously would have led to so much more research. In the UK, we have a guy on telly called Brian Cox, who is is sort of like uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson over here, I guess, if you will. And they have something called the Cox effect, where so many kids like went and did science at university after a lot of his programs are on TV. And it's right. that kind of effect that I think you you want to have when when someone connects with your writing or your communication right. online. Right. Let's stick with black holes for a minute. Why, what, why are they so fascinating? Like what's your, if you take like a step back, why do you think that they, um, what's, what's the, what's the sell? Like, why? I think they're so fascinating because we can never get any information from them. Okay. So a black hole is, is a place in space where there is so much matter that the gravity because of that is so strong that not even light can travel fast enough to escape it. And so light is how we get all of our information right right now <laughs> you know you're seeing me because of light and so the fact that light can't escape means we'll never know what's beyond that point of sort of no return around a black hole mm. and there's a lot of things we can do to, to to measure properties of the black hole from outside of it but never knowing you know what it would necessarily be like or only being able to describe it with something like math i think is what makes it so fascinating to people is this in little enigma, you know, that they wonder whether anyone will solve. And I think just because it's so unlike anything that we come across, mm -hmm. you know, in normal everyday life and normal everyday physics as well, it, it sort of, I think it's quite mind blowing to a lot of people and just the possibilities that that come out of it, you know, as well as, is I think what draws people in a lot. And there's been some, I mean, there's been progress in the last few years in understanding them, right? Like very, very much progress. Uh, yeah, I mean, the first image of a black hole last year really helped. Um, <laughs> that was something, being able to see that for the first time. And Sarah mentioned interstellar in regards to planets before, which which I'd never thought about it like that because I always associate interstellar with black holes because mm -hmm. of the the big one they sort of simulated and how it would actually look for the first time and the mm -hmm. fact that that was almost quite similar was was extraordinary to me and it you know it, we found ourselves saying things like Einstein was right again you know he he got his ideas of gravity right but there's a lot of things where we're still testing you know with many other supermassive black holes out there with our own supermassive black hole in the center of the Milky Way that the sun orbits it, there's just so much still to know. I think there's more that we don't know than we do know, yeah. which I think is, 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 it excites me anyway, so. Yeah. Um, let me just, before we go on, I wanna tell our viewers to put uh, any questions that you have into the into the chat, because we'll have time after we speak uh, to take some questions. So any, any questions you have about what, What's going on up there? Um, you can ask. Um, actually, I, before I had like, I, I want to skip to a question because we both mentioned and Interstellar, and so I'm curious. Sort of, do you, do you read science fiction, and and if so, sort of give us some recommendations. Like, who do you think, who who do you think writes uh, science fiction that both sort of really kind of grapples with the science and has fun with it, and in a way that doesn't feel sort of so 
off, you know, outland or what, I won't, I won't preface it anymore. Just what, who do you like? <laughs> Sarah or Sarah or Becky. Um, um, yeah. I'll let Becky take that first. I've got to give that a thought for a moment. Okay. okay. I have, I have a few cause I, I do read a lot of sci-fi and fantasy and I, I particularly like the crossover of sci-fi and fantasy. Like where yeah. is that crossover? You know, Lord of the Rings is classes of fantasy you know, because it's, but it's on a completely different planet. Technically, if you think about it, a lot of these fantasies that you open, they have a map at the beginning, you know, they're on completely different planets, but they have exactly the same stars. And I'm like, so is it not, you know, all this kind of stuff. It fascinates me where that line is. Um, but some of the sci-fi that I love, obviously I thought The Martian was fantastic. That was written for people like me, you know, just the maths behind it, it was great. One of the books I've absolutely loved, it's a series of books. The first one's called Red Rising by Pierce Brown. And mm -hmm. every time I try and explain this, I, I fail miserably, but it's set in the solar system where man has colonized the solar system. Humanity has colonized the solar system. And somehow in that colonization, humanity has also evolved into sort of a hierarchy where, you know, sort of the, the bottom rung of the hierarchy is still humans like us, but the top rung are this, you know, excelled in everything, their, their physical perfection and their intelligent and whatever. But then also their whole society runs mm. off like Roman law. <laughs> and, it, and it's funny. And it sounds so, it's, it's like, it's sort of like gladiator in space, I guess, is the best way I can describe it. And honestly, it's so gripping as a series as well. Um, and I don't want to give anything away about it, but it's so well done. The science in it is fantastic as well in terms of like visiting other planets and, and everything like that and, and how they would have terraformed them. And I thought it was a fantastic book. Fantastic. I don't have much to add to that glowing conversation. Some time ago, I reread um, all of Robert Heinlein's books. This is like a oh. class of 1950. And mm. it was pretty amazing because it's so creative, but it has a lot of the fun things like the twin paradox. If you have a twin mm. and one goes on a trip and travels at near the speed of light, then they come back and everyone here on earth has aged, but time has slowed down for that person. And he, it's kind of hard to read now because it's from a while back, but predicting around now time. So some of the stuff he got wrong, some he got right, but I really enjoyed that. But I'm going to take some of Becky's recommendations and, and read them. <laughs> you have Red Rising. It's a long series, but you'll, it, it's, it hooks you in. It really does. <laughs> um, Becky, can you, can you tell me about YouTube and sort of the role mm -hmm. that it plays for you as a sort of connector with, with, an, with an audience, particularly around yeah. science, you know, like it's, I, I've, as, as just as an aside, I've been sort of struck in COVID times at like how Twitter, for example, has become such a useful medium for epidemiologists and virologists to, to get their message. You wouldn't think that it would. You think of social media as sort of like this kind of reductive medium, you know, that, that doesn't allow for, for complexity. Um, I mean, YouTube's obviously different because you have more control over you know, what you're saying and who's seeing you. Um, but it has its own sort of issues in terms of sort of what videos you're, you're kind of steered towards. Um, but I just wonder as somebody who's been successful on it and successful talking about science, sort of how, how, you, how you understand YouTube. Yeah, um, I love YouTube as a platform. I think it's fantastic. I mean, if you look at the stats, it's something like 80% of adults use YouTube or something like that. Um, and so it, it's a great, platform in which to reach people and also mm -hmm. for that two-way communication as well and you know in the comments where someone can watch a video and then ask a follow-up question and immediately you can respond I don't know really any other platform that you can you know take in that much information in, in the form of a video in terms of really understanding and then like ask a question that gets um sort of you know responded to if, if the person's at least awake I'm not always awake when people are asking the questions um but I, something I want to touch on what you said there is is this idea of you know what you're recommended to view and the thing about YouTube right. is that you know if, if you're on normal TV and you're just flicking through channels you could happen across anything and that could draw you in and it could be a nature documentary or a, a science documentary or something like that and that could draw you in even if you're not typically the person who would engage with science stuff or you think science isn't for you or you think it's too hard or whatever it might be on youtube that's not going to happen because you're only going to be recommended things by the algorithm and based on what you've previously watched and based right. on your age gender and location mm. which is, is is worrying to me and the fact that it can be this sort of like circular loop where you know the the people who are searching for science content in the first place and then the other people that are going to be recommended it 
And if, you know, people talk about reaching different audiences and diverse audiences, if they're not searching for it on YouTube, they're not going to find it. They're not going to see it. Mm -hmm. And that's what worries me. So I've had a big, steep learning curve on sort of like, you know, getting people to click on stuff, you know, in terms of thumbnail and title. How do you, how do you get people to click on stuff when you're competing against pranks and cat videos <laughs> and <laughs> they're like whatever else there is on the internet? You know, it's like, yeah. how do you do that without sensationalizing the science or, or, you know, really overblowing the result of a science? It's, it's quite, it's quite difficult, but then also making sure people stay watching a video as well and engaging with, with, the, with a different audience. If you're trying to reach a different audience, you know, how do you do that across like YouTube trends and all this kind of stuff? It's, it helps knowing something about machine learning through my own research, to be honest, because I can actually read the paper, the academic paper that describes the YouTube algorithm and go, oh, okay, I, I think I get that now, <laughs> how it works. So. Does it change the way that you present the science? I mean, do you find yourself having to sort of hype up things that you might not have in another setting? No. No, I don't think so. I think it necessarily changes the, the format of how you present it, but not what you present. I think that's really important. My one rule is like, don't dumb it down. Like no one wants dumbed down science. They just want science like presented with language and with, you know, enthusiasm that they get when having any other conversation, you know, with anybody right. else and, and just making it, you know, just something that normal people can just chat about over a cup of coffee or something like that if they want, you know, or a, whatever it might be, you know, you can be like, oh, I watched this video today and yeah, now I'm going to talk mm -hmm. to my friend about it because it was so interesting. It's those kind of things that you want to you want to trigger with a video. That's like something that stays with people once they click on it. Um, and I think that comes from the science itself. So. Mm. Um, Sarah, I have to ask you about the Venus discovery. Okay, sure. Um, and we had a question actually that kind of touches on that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, how um, how excited should we be? Well. <laughs> It's been a bit of a whirlwind. In fact, it's been completely overwhelming. My team or team that I was involved with discovered a very unusual finding actually on our low, our sister planet Venus, which by the way, appears completely inhospitable to any kind of life as we know it. It's mm -hmm. very hot surface. It's clouds are the right temperature for life, but are incredibly acidic. We found a sign of a gas. We found a definitive detection of a gas called phosphine, which on earth is only associated with life in it in oxygen-free environments. Hmm. And although our detection of phosphine is robust, we just put it out there that there are two equally preposterous explanations. One is that there's some unknown chemistry. Because you know, all the phosphorus on Venus, it shouldn't be in phosphine, which is a phosphorus atom with three hydrogen atoms. It should be in a phosphate. It should be a phosphorus attached to oxygen atoms. Like this may not mean anything to people who don't know anything about science or who um, don't know chemistry, but you know, in an environment with a lot of oxygen and very little hydrogen, you shouldn't have atoms sticking with hydrogen. It just isn't, isn't, isn't something that happens. Right. But either there's some crazy chemistry that we don't know about, or there might be life floating around in Venus's clouds. Huh. And it's been incredibly exciting because we spent a couple of years working on every possible chemistry explanation that we know of showing that even if it could generate phosphine like volcanoes or meteorites or lightning, it would only generate the tiniest amounts of phosphine way too small to match with our observations. Mm. So it was a pretty crazy um, couple of years. And we just made the announcement two weeks ago yesterday and the media went wild. Yeah. We made front page of New York times under the fold, but still front page <laughs> and all around the world, journalists went bananas on us. And then they came back a second time for like a more thoughtful article. And then our colleagues, every single colleague, I haven't heard from Becky yet, but maybe I will has her own like, or his or her own like favorite chemistry, which like the order of magnitude level, or even this one very pushy professor wrote, oh, I read the New York Times article. What about this chemistry explanation? Mm. And it wasn't even like reading the paper. As Becky said, she reads the papers about the YouTube AI algorithms. <laughs> mm. And yeah, so just based on New York Times and write back a week later, well, hey, you haven't written back yet. So yeah. we're, we're being blasted by everybody. So yeah. That's what it's why did, you, why did you think to, like, why was the focus ever on Venus? Or were you looking at like a number of different planets in our solar system? No, actually, so people have want to find the unknown. And one thing I tried to convey in my book mm -hmm. was it's a journey of exploration. You know, we're like the people who went to Antarctica for the first time. You might say, why did they want to go to Antarctica or the South Pole? But they just were driven to explore. And that that's really what it's about. And it's um, the project lead, Professor Jane Greaves, just decided, she's actually a very respected radio astronomer, 
who studies uh, disks around other stars. Hmm. But she decided to point the radio telescope at Venus to look for a gas, specifically phosphine, uh, to look for signs of life on Venus. Now, people have speculated on life on Venus for the last several decades, half a century, starting with Carl Sagan. It's a very, I see you looking really puzzled. It is a very fringe topic. It is usually not touched by, you know, no more than a handful of people who do it as a kind of side job. Right. But yeah, just Jane decided to do this. She recruited my team later on when she found out we were also working on phosphine. And it's one of those um, journeys of exploration in science. (laughs) What I love about it was that, you know, I, I did like a video summarizing the news and everything. And then the questions in my comments were so insightful that I ended up making a, video, a second video answering all those comments wow. to astro- asking them to astrobiologists like yourself, Sarah, and, um, and planetary physicists. Because the amount of questions that they asked, I just didn't know the answer to. One that struck me the most was this question of whether we could have transferred life to Venus from Earth. Right. And my immediate knee jerk was like, no. But then you remember there was a mission on the International Space Station where they exposed microbes to just the vacuum of space and the radiation and everything that comes with it. And they survived for three years. I know. Can you believe that? That life can survive outside a spacecraft? Hmm. Like no. Vacuum. No, we can't even believe that. Well, the thing on Venus is that any life that went there, any of our life, it would be destroyed immediately because the air there is so dry and the droplets of clouds, they're not water, they're sulfuric acid. And if you've, um, yeah, you can just Google sulfuric acid sugar and see what would happen to us. Our DNA is made of sugar. We'll get destroyed um, instantly, pretty much. So no, our life couldn't survive there. But it was still a fair question. Yeah. And it, I mean, it blew my mind because I never thought to ask it either. And that's that's what's so incredible about communicating with people. They ask the questions that when you get so stuck in the research yourself, you never, you never sort of come far enough away from it. Yeah, I'm now involved with like, the next phase. So that's the thing about memoirs is they end at a certain time. And Becky and Gal, as you know, it takes a long time when you're finished writing the book for that book to become a real book. Right. To get people. Yeah. So I started working on Venus two years ago, which is pretty much when the book was finished. Mm. So that part didn't get in there. But now I'm leading a mission concept study of how we could go to Venus and sample the clouds directly for life. And to your point, Becky, or your audit, your questioner's point, we'll have to make sure, like, if we find sign of life, it, that it's not contamination. Because even though our life couldn't survive, our mission, at least the first missions, won't last very long, 10 mm-hmm. minutes, two days, maybe. And we'll have to make sure that we didn't detect some some piece of life we brought with. Some hitchhikers, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm... I'm curious just to like, you know, zoom out for a minute um, to ask you both sort of as women in your field, uh, what are the particular, are there particular challenges? Is it, a, is it a particularly welcoming field for women or not? I find I've been struck in the last year that there's a number of books by, by you know, prominent women astrophysicists. Um, and it sort of made me sort of my eyes kind of open up and go, wow, I guess, you know, th- just to wonder if, if, if there is something about the field itself that is more open or has been more open or just what your experiences have been as, as women? Well, there's been women in astronomy traditionally for a very long time. William Herschel, who was famous in the UK for discovering, um, I don't wanna get this wrong, Uranus, I wanna say, but- I think it was Uranus, yeah. <laughs> he had this giant telescope and his sister, Caroline, became an extremely well-known astronomer who started as his assistant. You know, we had, um, yeah, Mariah Mitchell's an astronomer here from the Northeast. So women have always been involved with astronomy. I think it's that we do have a lot of women in astronomy compared to physics, engineering, math, but we don't always have a voice. You know, your mind kind of wants to go to the older man with like the crazy white hair kind of. So I'm glad that there's more and more books because I think it will help women, women get out there or change the stereotype maybe even. Yeah, I think that's one of the things I'm trying to do with my YouTube is that one thing I hear all the time is that women and girls don't feel like they can be physicists or engineers, very male dominated, stereotypically subjects, because they think they'd have to change themselves to fit in with that field. They'd have to become less feminine or dress a certain way or whatever. And I'm like over here, like, hey, I'm an astrophysicist who loves nail polish cats, Taylor Swift, like that's okay. (laughs) You know, there's nothing that's like mutually exclusive, like with being a scientist. And I think that's the the message that at least having 
the, this platform and having, you know, the being able to write a book and being given that voice, as Sarah says, is just, is just so important. And the, as she says, we, we, historically, women have been so involved with astronomy because it is one of those sciences that anyone, wherever you are in the world, you can do. And right. I think that's what makes a lot of young kids feel so connected to it because you know that that wasn't kept from them in a, an early age for any reason that it, it didn't have any connotations with the toys they played with or whatever it might be and so I think that that might be something where it stems from but I think a lot of us out there doing astronomy and astrophysics I think it's a very welcoming field I have a great time and I just I'd encourage as many as who want to be involved with it to be involved yeah and I think that stereotype is really important at MIT there's a number of very well-dressed women professors. One of them is older now. She is an oceanographer and she's originally from Venice. And every time she went back to Italy, she would buy new clothes, very special, only hand wash them. And she's the best dressed professor, you know, at MIT. I did want to make another point, but you know, sometimes you don't want to reveal too much, but well, you can read my book. It's pretty personal. Like when I was younger, so I don't know how old Becky is, but I never had any problems that I noticed. But as I got older, um, men don't like it when you're going to surpass them. Mm -hmm. So if you're like that, oh, you're so cute, love your nail polish, they're not going to say that, that's politically incorrect. But then as you kind of get older, more successful, whether that's your huge reach on YouTube, whether that's your book, whether that's just your, your sheer scientific accomplishments, they don't like it. And so I've definitely experienced some kind of weirdness lately. And that mm -hmm. has I've been perplexing. Yeah, I think that's one of those things that just unfortunately pervades society. It's not necessarily something unique to science, unfortunately. But I do notice it. And this this is not something I've done like a, a big study into. This is sort of like, a, you know, just what I have noticed just every day, sort of anecdotally, is that on the comments on my videos compared to the comments on uh, some other videos of astrophysicists specifically, not just sort of like a science communicator or a science journalist on YouTube um, who are male, the comments are strikingly different. Mm -hmm. um, there, there are comments where people will either criticize like my editing or whatever it is. They'll try and like, you know, give me tips to improve or whatever. Cause they think, you know, they're trying to get one up on me. I don't know about something or they'll yeah. point out <laughs> some mistake I've made or, or something like that. Or they'll question my credentials and you're just like, you know, they're just having a good science chat over on the other one. You could have just as easily asked the science question. There's a lot of people doing that and it's, and it's so nice to see. But I also make sure to filter my YouTube comments as well. So I've, remo I've removed all comments that have the words marry or kitchen in them. Um, <laughs> because I don't want anybody, especially like young girls, scrolling down to the comments and seeing right. me reduced to my gender with just like marriage proposals. Wow. But also the, the kitchen one makes me laugh. It's like, oh, you belong back in the kitchen. I'm like, well, I'll happily go and do my science from the kitchen because there's well better access to snacks there. So. Exactly. <laughs> Why they're even watching it if they really want to be negative. I'm sure I don't, I don't get it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I, one more question and then I'm going to see if we have some questions from the audience. And again, if anybody wants to, to, to put some questions in the chat, um, there's, there's time for some questions. Um, it's again, it's like sort of thinking about what you're doing in this particular moment. And I just, I, it feels like science itself is sort of under attack these days. Um, the search uh, during COVID for concrete answers, people want to know exactly, you know, is it X or Y? Uh, has made people, I feel like, look at the scientific method itself with some suspicion. You know, people are dying, uh, you know, when people are dying, it's hard to accept the notion of trial and error. But yeah. that's obviously essential to science, um, and particularly the science that you do, which deals with such enormous unknowns. Um, and so I just wonder how, how you think about sort of defending and preserving a place for science in our society. Um, right? Well, you know, one thing that is not what you asked, but science takes time. I mean, we all want the answer. We're all just hunkering down here, like desperate for that vaccine to get rolled out right. to hundreds right. of millions, hundreds of millions of Americans. And so I think that requires a lot of patience and we don't have all the answers, right? I mean, in, in both of our fields, I think that's tough as well. And it is trial and error. And often one study will come out, like how often does this happen for black holes or for Venus, right? We're like, it could be this, it could be that. And everyone has their own theory. Right. But in these... Um, COVID, you know, someone will put out a theory. Well, if you're type O, which I am, type O blood, hey, you're not going to be susceptible. Well, I want to know. And I asked my doctor, could I get a blood test to find out my blood type? And she said, no, because she doesn't believe that theory. And then other people say this, and then they say that. So then it looks like there's a lot of error. But in fact, that's just the, unfortunately, the, 
the scientific process has to have a lot of back and forth before it can come to what is really fact. Right. Yeah. I mean, what was that? Your Venus study took three years from the first well, actually, data acquisition? Five. Professor Jane Greaves started it about five years ago. My team joined a couple of years ago. But yeah, it takes a long time. Yeah, I think that's the big thing is that people don't appreciate how long science takes. But then the second thing I think is is part, I mean, this is not a criticism of any single country, but, you know, education systems in terms of what we actually learn about science at school. You don't learn the scientific process. You learn facts, mm -hmm. right? But what are the facts? How do people know the facts? You know, and, and that's something that's not gotten across is that, you know, there are some one random thing that you learn at school, the structure of an atom, for example, electrons go around protons. That was hundreds of years worth of research that took for that one throwaway statement, you know, by, by a teacher in, in a classroom to students who'd probably forget it, you know, maybe hours later. So it, it, it's getting across how the scientific process works at high school or even younger level, rather than waiting for, you know, kids to get to uh, university, college, where only the science majors are going to ever learn that. And so I think people need to understand what the scientific process is, how trial and error works, how long that actually takes until, you know, what goes from, these are my thoughts, these are my ideas, these are my hypothesis to explain the stuff we've observed or the experiment that we've done. And it take many, many years to get to, this is now accepted scientific theory that we will actually teach, right, right, you know? Right. And, and so- I to add one more thing, like it's really hard with emotion to, to kind of fall back on logic and scientific process. And so, you know, if you, you know, we see what's happening, if someone close to us dies of COVID, it just, it's easy to unravel and to just get angry and not be able to have that kind of patience and logical thinking and it affects you so personally. I mean, it seems like one of the other challenges just right now is that when the notion of sort of truth and sort of objective reality is under attack, you know, that, that you have politicians who say, well, you know, it could be this or it could be that, that in some ways it makes it harder to make a case for or to explain how the scientific method works because, because the notion of, of a process that, you know, you have to try, it might fail, you know, then try something else sort of in a weird way feeds into this idea that we can't really know anything. And so if we can't really know anything, there are no absolutes at all. Um, and uh, and I, think, I think that can be, that, that's what has made with COVID in particular, a, a tough moment for science. Yeah. Really tough. And it's true. Like you're not going to, there's so many people out there where we can't change their minds with, with science. Because right. yeah, as Becky was saying, they don't understand the process or people just don't want to, they don't want to believe. Right. Yeah. And I think another thing that people struggle with is how much, you know, predictive models are used in science, you know, that you uh, take some data and then you're like, oh, this is the model I have to fit it. And it fits it really well. Therefore, you know, this, this is my working hypothesis. This is what I believe is the, is the right answer to this. And I think we've definitely seen that with COVID with saying, you know, this is the model, you know, the R number is greater than one. It's going to have an exponential rise and people are like, well, it, it's just a model. They don't know that for sure. And it's like, Yes, but this is how we build up predictive models. Right. We work on what has happened previously to predict what happens in the future. It's how you get your, you know, any insurance that you will buy will be based on any of these predictive models. You know, your weather that you get off thing is based on a predictive model. And so people are using them every day in their life. And yet when it comes to something like that, that there's doubt cast on it. And, it, and it, it's, it's this whole sort of like people are sick of experts thing again. It's like, well, you kind of need them if you want to know what to do in these situations. Right, right. Okay, let me look at the questions here because we have just a few more minutes. Um, this is coming from Richard Lamb. He said, is there any additional info on the ghost galaxy um, uh, that may have passed or hit the Milky Way? Do either one of you know? Anything? I haven't heard that term used to describe it, but it, it could be um, we, the Milky Way has interactions with galaxies. I mean, it's having interactions with galaxies right now. There's so many what we call dwarf galaxies, very small galaxies like the Magellanic Clouds. If anyone's been to the Southern Hemisphere, they'll have seen them that are orbiting the Earth. And we see these huge trails of stars around the Milky Way that are presumably from when one of those galaxies has got a bit close and got sort of torn apart by gravity. You can imagine mm -hmm. if someone's seen something about it, a ghost galaxy, something like that has happened, but perhaps where it was so faint that we necessarily haven't seen it before, but maybe we're now detecting its influence because of gravity, perhaps. And mm -hmm. we have to remember, it feels you know so calm and so still where we stand on Earth, but there's um, a lot going on up there. Um, and we have someone, Neil Feldman, asking if you are either Star Wars or Star Trek fans. 
Any takers? No. I'll just be brief and I'll let Becky carry it on. I love Star Trek The Next Generation. Uh -huh. That was when I was in a major TV watching phase as like a teenager and I watched pretty much every episode. I loved it. Becky? Okay, that makes me feel better because I've never seen any Star Trek. The only Star Trek I've seen is the Chris Pine movies and that makes me go so far down in Trekkie's estimations. But I'm a massive Star Wars fan. So maybe that redeems me. Okay, great. It was just a bit before my time. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> Back and watch it. It's like classic, you know, like even Star Wars. Yeah. They, um, yeah. Like my kids, when I have uh, teenagers now, but they watch the um you know number one two three and then they go back and watch, watch four five six over and over so yeah do you, do you do you when 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 you watch movies that are touching on your fields are you sitting there critical of the oh no that, that would ruin different? the movie you know <laughs> the movie gravity really like compelling story story yeah. survival yeah. but the kind of chain of events that start the movie is just not realistic so no you can't if you're critical there's no enjoyment i don't think Right. It's also horrific as an astronomer because they destroy the Hubble Space Telescope in like the first 10 minutes and you're there like, no, not our baby. <laughs> but I, I mean, you do have to just, you have to turn it off. Like, I mean, I Interstellar, like I enjoyed it, but I had to fully turn it off because the back of my mind was going, they needed a Saturn V to get off the Earth, but then they got off that planet around the black hole just by going, like in a little <laughs> spaceship. So. Any movie that didn't have, like, we're so cautious as a civilization, you know, when it does come time to go to Mars, like there's this new series out there called Away. Have you watched that yet? Away. I've heard of it. I've not you watched, watched it. I haven't it. seen it. Um, the first astronauts that go to the moon for the, to go to Mars for the first time, actually. Well, I won't give you any spoilers. But let's just say a lot of stuff happens. You know, yeah. if you were to film the regular, the group that does go to Mars, hopefully it's supposed to be the most boring mission ever where nothing goes wrong. And if it does, there'll be one tiny thing that they've worked through already. There's not like five things happening in an episode. That's not what happens. But, you know, I'm just saying a regular person's life or would just be so totally boring that um, you have to obviously over dramatize or it's just not going to be any. Yeah. Interest. It was yeah. one of the over dramatizations that they mixed up metric and imperial again, like on one of the first <laughs> Mars probes that was sent. <laughs> <laughs> one of the first was which probe was that it was sent by an American company, but there was some numbers provided by the British and they were in the wrong units and it crashed. I can't remember which one, what it was called, but yes, I, I remember that. <laughs> Sarah, it reminds me that I wanted to ask you about the status of the Starshade program. I I, had, I I think that we at the Times did a profile of you a few years ago and you there was a lot about that in there. Um, and then I was curious and I know that as part of that, in that profile, you were sort of describing basically trying to sell this idea, you know, to, to, to get funding for it and then to get support behind it. So I guess explain it first and then kind of give us a, a status update. Sure, sure. Well, you know, we'd really like to look around bright sun-like stars and look for planets like our own. And it's incredibly challenging to do. I mean, our Earth, it's not fainter than the faintest galaxies we've ever observed with Hubble, but it's right next to a big, bright, massive star, another Earth around another sun, because mm -hmm. all stars are suns. And this idea was actually started in the 1960s to put up a giant specially shaped screen. We call it starshade. And starshade would be tens of meters in diameter. That's mm -hmm. 100 feet, let's say, for Imperial. Mm -hmm. And it would be formation flying with the space telescope like tens of thousands of kilometers away, mm -hmm. away from Earth's gravity, because Earth's gravity gradient makes it hard to formation fly precisely. And these would have to be so perfectly lined up so the planet could block out the starlight to huge amounts so that only planet light enters the telescope. Mm -hmm. And back when the New York Times profile was written, it was a real heyday for starshade because my team had brought it from like a fringe laughable concept that no astronomer believes should ever be in our toolkit to uh, we brought all the different teams together. We had money to move some technology forward and we just created the story for why Starshade can be built and why it should be built. Hmm. So Starshade is still moving along. Like in a giant engineering project, we have to break it down to lots and lots of small steps. Mm -hmm. And we call them technology tall poles. We try to bring those down. And so Starshade is still moving forward with technology. In astronomy now, we're all in the US, we're on a bit of a pause because every 10 years, there's a decadal survey. It's called the decadal survey, where mm -hmm. astronomers get together and supposedly our objective, <laughs> which doesn't always happen, and they actually priority rank order projects. Interesting. Interesting. And so Starshade and others, we're all kind of gunning to be number one. We have to get really high on that list in order to have enough money to make the mission real. 
Mm-hmm. So we're on a bit of a hold now, but technology money is still flowing and we're not a funded mission yet, but we hope to be. It seems this idea is so sort of wonderfully simple, like the, just the, the logic of it just like immediately makes sense. Uh, even to someone like me, is that, is that why people were, were, were found it laughable? Like what, why, why was the reaction at first a, a sort of a negative one or dismissive one? Well, it's dismissive because our earth is so faint compared to the sun. If we want to find the earth sun twin, um, we have to block out starlight to one part in 10 billion. Right. And that's hard. And so let's say you live in a house in the suburbs and you want to build a deck mm-hmm. and you're going to measure like the pieces of wood you're going to make the deck with. Like you're, you're measuring those to maybe say, maybe it's like five meters. Maybe you'll do 5.1 meters. You're not going to do 5.000 like to 10 decimal places meters, but it's laughable because in order to do that, to 10 decimal places, like the formation flying, how precise it has to fly, mm-hmm. and the tolerances on how far the star shade can move laterally away from that telescope, the petals, like how precisely they have to be engineered, like the whole thing is just an exercise in um, out there, like crazy engineering. That's why people found it laughable. Yeah. I see. I see. I mean, you think back though on science and you think about how many ideas were completely laughable, like way back when, you know, atom being split, huh, completely laughable, like black holes even existing, completely laughable. And this is why I love like hearing you talk about these kind of projects, Sarah, just like, you know, the pushing that boundary of technology forward and just, right. you know, it, it just, yeah, it's goose pimples. That's what it yeah, is. that's part of the journey of explanation, journey of exploration that I did try to capture in my book. It's, yeah. it's the pushing the envelope to see new things. Yeah. Lovely. Um, well, that's close to a good place to, to end on. I, I do have one question that I uh, from readers about uh, Twitter accounts, whether each of you have a Twitter account and whether you can share that uh, just so people can follow you if they want to. Yeah, sure. Uh, I'm on Twitter at Dr. Becky, D-R-B-E-C-K-Y with an underscore at the end. And then I'm on Instagram too, if you want to follow me on there, which is the same, but with an S on the end. And I'm on Twitter at, at Prof. Sarah Seeger. And let me remind people of their uh, wonderful books, um, Space at the Speed of Light uh, by Becky Smith Hertz and um, The Smallest Light in the Universe by Sarah Seeger. Uh, thank you both for chatting with me. This was, this was a lot of fun. Thank this you. Was fun. Thanks for having us. Thanks. <laughs>